Today, I get to sit down with a great friend and mentor of mine, Catherine Wong, and you're gonna wanna hear this. Hey everybody, welcome back to Design Today. I'm your host, Dylan Winspear. And on this episode, we get to sit down with a wickedly talented individual. Her name is Catherine Wong. She is the chief of product at Domo, which is a publicly traded business intelligence platform that I just so happen to work at. Uh, and I've been able to work with Ka Catherine for uh, three plus years now. And I can't tell you how many lessons I have learned from her. Uh, we've been able to become good friends. She's a great mentor of mine. So many things that I've talked about on this pack podcast have come from her. So I'm gonna break character a little bit and just let you hear this. I recorded this episode sometime at the end of last year, uh, months ago, probably six, seven, eight months ago. And um, I just finished editing it. You really are gonna want to hear this. I pulled at least eight or nine little gems out of this podcast and I'm going, I don't know how everyone doesn't know this and everyone could benefit from it. Uh, again, just great stuff in there. So give this episode a listen. You're going to get it in its entirety right here, right now with Catherine Wong. Here we go. Really appreciate this. Um, Catherine, welcome to the Design Today Show. I appreciate you coming on. Happy to be here. This has been something that I've really looked forward to for a long time. When I started doing the podcast about a year and a half ago, there was a handful of people who I've kind of met and rub shoulders with over the years that I go, it would be an honor to have them on the podcast. And you were always one of those people. Oh, that's really kind of you. It took me a long time <laughs> to get the courage to ask because I felt like I kind of had to prove myself uh, before I started asking some of those people. But, you know, here we are today and I really appreciate your time. Um, I have referenced some of the things that you've taught me mm -hmm. uh, over the last couple of years on uh, a number of different podcasts. Um and I won't go into all those details, but again, you you have taught me so much over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I just thought it'd be definitely worthwhile to get you to come on the show and share some of these things that you've learned along the way uh, that could help other designers, product managers who are in similar situations, you know, building their career. So here we are today. And I, I, again, I thank you for it. I love it. Um, I want to kind of have you start by telling us and those who are listening a little bit about uh, your story and how you got to the position that you're in today. You've shared this with me over the years and I've always just found it. It's a, it's a ground up story. You know, you started, uh, in the trenches like everyone else. And, you know, a couple of different companies later, you're in the position of uh, chief product officer. And I mean, you've, you're doing so much for such large companies that I want you to kind of tell a little bit of that story where you started and how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, happy to. So um, in college, I studied computer science. I went to BYU. Mm -hmm. And I was one of very few women in the program. I uh, graduated at exactly the wrong time, right um, right before the bubble burst, the okay. internet. <laughs> so, you know, here I was, this college grad, super uh -huh. excited. You had had the whole heyday of the internet. Um, and then in 2000, I graduated and then the world came crashing down, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, then 9-11 happened the next year in 2001. So these were really dark times and coming up, you know, it felt pretty daunting sure. uh, to look around you and see that. Um, but I'm really grateful for the experiences because what wound up happening is, you know, there were a lot of layoffs. You, Everyone was just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. I was one of the few engineers um, that this little startup was able to keep and that eventually became Omniture. Okay. So, you know, having that experience of really, I coded so many hours, I can't even uh, count. Yeah. You know, I remember not seeing daylight for years. Sure. Because <laughs> I was just coding uh, way into the, the wee hours of the and morning. what were you coding? Like, what was your role? Yeah, so I was a software engineer. You and know, you I just were. joined yeah. as um, a line engineer. Interesting. And uh, we coded what eventually became Site Catalyst, Omniture Site Catalyst. And so... Amazing. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. And the advantage to that kind of experience was I got to wear so many different hats. Mm -hmm. And that was something I had intentionally sought out. I really wanted the opportunity to understand how is product made? Right. It's not just the code. I knew, right? There's design. There is um, the user experience. There's the scope. There's the business fit. Mm -hmm. um, there's technical documentation, mm -hmm. localization. How do you speak to different international, um, you know, user sets? Yep. And so, really being able to 
almost having to sit in so many different seats at a single time, right, um, gave me a breadth of experience that I'm so grateful for because I think that gives you an empathy yeah. for, you know, we talk about empathy for our users, um, you know, people who buy the product, but yeah. having empathy for those that we work with is incredibly valuable as well, 100%. you know? So, um, we really just kind of uh, heads down, worked super hard to, to survive and then grow that business. Um, and I took on various roles throughout that growth trajectory. 2006, we took Omnitra Public. Yep. Uh, and then after we went public, I focused on mergers and acquisitions. So again, so raising like, my hand. But that seems like a jump from just software engineer Absolutely. to manager of acquisitions. Yeah. So how did you find yourself in that role? So it's one of the things that I'll often um, provide when I'm mentoring folks. Yep. Uh, one of my tenants is always say yes. Yeah. Part of it was we needed it. Yep. Someone They needed someone to go and focus on integrating these acquired companies, um, focusing on the tech. And it meant that I had to travel a lot. It meant that I had to go live in London for a little while. And I just raised my hand and said, yes, I'll go. Um, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, even though it is daunting, I was scared on the plane over yeah. to London, right? Because I just thought, I've never done this before. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll land sure. and um, meet the people and, yeah. and, and just get going. Um, but it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. Yeah. So. I think saying yes is a big part. And you did that for how long? Life. So um, I focused on um, integration for several years, okay. really. Um, we were acquired by Adobe in 2009. Yep. And then then my role shifted again, you know, and I was managing global engineering teams, uh, which was also just wonderful. It had been on my list of things from a career growth perspective. Cool. And um, it lined up perfectly. Cool. And I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Adobe and, um, you know, the culture that they cultivate mm -hmm. and the opportunities that I got there. So then managing hundreds of engineers, um, all over the world. And I, you know, got to learn so much about what it means to operate at scale yeah. and to manage through influence. Mm -hmm. Cause no longer could I say, like my success is completely controlled within my world, you edit at that scale, you have to be able to coordinate with others and manage mm -hmm. their influence. So um, really learned a ton from people like Kevin Lynch, who is now, you know, at Apple and um, Brad Renter, who was the GM of Adobe at that time for our business unit. So I think, you know, having those experiences then prepared me for the next jump I made, which was I knew that I wanted to do one more small startup. Yeah. And they take so much energy. I knew I had to of do it course. when I was relatively still had the energy, yep. you know, somewhat young. And so um, wound up actually coming to Domo. And when you started at Domo, was it in the position you're in right now? No, I came uh, to oh, run that. engineering. I yeah. I know that. Um, it was a discussion that Josh and I had had. So Josh James, right, founder yep. of Omniture, had, um, has always been a mentor. And uh, we had been in touch even while I stayed at Adobe and mm -hmm. he was doing this new thing. Um, but when I looked at what Domo was doing and the approach they were taking, I just thought, I've got to be a part of that. That's a very different take yeah. on a really relevant problem set, yeah. you know. Um, so because of kind of where they were, it made sense for me to come in as um, SVP of engineering, really just focus on... I wanted to understand the tech. I yep. wanted to understand kind of the guts. Um, and then a couple of years after that, you know, my role changed again. And so here we are. Yeah. Um, I have engineering, product management, user design uh, in my org. And I love it. Yeah. The blending of those disciplines, um, especially with just the caliber of people that we get to work with, um, it's a highlight. It's very true. You know, one of the things that you were just talking about as you're saying, you know, you've always said yes along the way. Yeah. Uh, it reminded me of something else that you shared with me. Again, this was a year or two back uh, where you talked about, you know, kind of climbing in your career isn't necessarily a right. ladder and you liken it more to a jungle gym. Yeah. And you, going side to side and saying yes and trying different things is more along the lines of what resonates with you and the direction that you take. Is that right? It is. And I think, you know, Sheryl Sandberg references that jungle gym okay. in her book, Lean In. And I, it's, I think not only a fantastic thing, I think you kind of need to in mm -hmm. this day and age, because the experiences that we try and create for our um, customers 
our customers are global. They are right. They have so many different walks of life. Um, that we're selling to. And so really getting that empathy and understanding all facets of the business and what yeah. it takes to create that, I actually strongly recommend it. So in some cases I did lateral moves. In some cases I made moves that looked like I was maybe going backwards, mm -hmm. but it didn't matter to me. Cause again, I think it's a jungle gym and really understanding. More experience. Yeah. That curiosity I think is something that is another thing I talk about. Um, when you can tap in to that natural curiosity, yep. um, a lot of times conflict resolution gets a lot easier. You're able to navigate organizations and teams better because it really speaks to that human connection, right? Yeah. I'm curious about you. Why are you feeling this way? Um, how does this feel to be in this job? Or, you know, what are the expectations that you have for me mm -hmm. um, around my deliverables and um, what success looks like sure. for us all, sure. all of those things I think can really, if you tap into that curiosity, it really opens up a yeah. lot of conversation. I think it makes a lot of sense. So I can't really plan for this to happen, but this did happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, my son knew that you were coming in to <laughs> record today. And, uh, as soon as he knocked on the door and came in the house, he said to my wife, uh, when's Dylan's boss going to get here? <laughs> when's dad's boss going to get here? Yeah. And my wife said, that is his boss. He said, I didn't know bosses could be ladies. Yeah, that's so cute. And, um, you know, obviously it sheds some light on what I still have to teach my four-year-old. Um, but I kind of want you to, to speak to that. You know, what advice do you have for women in tech? Because, you know, relatively, it you don't see a whole lot of women holding yeah. the position that you hold in the tech space, especially here in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, so what advice do you have for the women in tech? Yeah, I think it's a great question, you know, that comes up a lot. And I feel like we would need 10 episodes to I really know. cover the depth of it. But um, I think, you know, one key piece of advice that I would give is to really, it kind of goes along with saying yes, mm -hmm. and that is daring to make mistakes. Yeah. Be okay with it. Be okay with stretching and not knowing all the answers up front, you yeah. know. Um, but when you raise your hand and you get in there and you've got you know, the ability to really work hard and listen and empathize. Um, I think that the artificial, um, sometimes people artificially cap themselves, mm -hmm. I guess is what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're willing to kind of jump in there and be okay with making some mistakes, um, then you can discover really where, where you are strong. Yeah. And not only that, I think that goes into kind of my second piece of advice, which is, um, you choose who you, where you get to work. Yep. So choose wisely, yep. right? I love getting the opportunity to work with you and with the crew at Domo. That's a choice because it's a great environment. Sure. We're able to connect, right? So when people are in an environment where they can make mistakes and they can raise their hands and they can say, I want to learn, and the group welcomes that, yeah. then you're going to grow your career, man or woman, yep. right? Um, so I think that's also really huge. I agree. You know, and I, I've always loved the emphasis that Domo has has tried to put in into diversity. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I really appreciate on the product side is that it was led by you, mm. you know, and I think it, it really starts to speak uh, for the company when someone like yourself is holding a position and not only just holding a position, but doing it really well. <laughs> Thanks. You know, and so... <laughs> You know, I've had people talk about, well, Domo, I, I've heard this about Domo. I've heard that about Domo. And mm -hmm. uh, I always just tell them, like, I'm not going to try and convince you. Right. I just say, come on in and shadow for an afternoon and you tell me what you think. Yeah. And I think if people were to do that, they'd recognize that, you know, it's not the bro culture they thought they heard of. No. Um, it, it is inclusive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I've always loved that emphasis. And I, again, I think it's led by great examples. So I think it's a great point. You know, we wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be there and I wouldn't be there mm -hmm. if it were a culture that was, you know, as some have maybe thought, sure. um, it's a great place to be. We have a good time and yeah, yeah we would welcome anyone to come and yeah. spend the afternoon with us. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, tell me about some of maybe the other sage advice that you've, uh, received over the years. Yeah. Uh, advice that maybe stuck with you and you've reflected on, you know, time and time again, as, as you've kind of grown in your career, what are some of those pieces? Yeah. So I feel like I've benefited so greatly from mentors mm -hmm. and from 
you know, I just kind of have the approach, I'm going to learn from everyone around me. It yeah. doesn't matter if they're the intern or, you know, the head of whatever. Sure. Um, so some of the great uh, pieces of advice that people have taught me, um, for example, um, one thing that Kevin Lynch taught me. Um, so he was CTO of Adobe. Um, now he's at Apple. Um, but he really taught me how important it was to think clearly about how I'm making people feel mm. because they're going to remember that a mm. lot more than the things that I say. I think sometimes as we're going, growing up in our careers, we're so um, passionate about the thing that we want to see done or yep. the expertise that we bring, all of this training, yep. you know, um, and we really want to see the outcome and that's wonderful. But the reality is we're dealing in the business of people. Mm -hmm. And so when we can really take a step back and go, okay, I know what my message is and I know what the outcome is, but how are people going to feel mm -hmm. after I leave, right? Or after this meeting ends, that's a really powerful question that yep. I think it was um, really profound when he gave me some you know, ideas and some coaching on how to really think about that. Well, and again, you, you, you've taken that advice and you've allowed it to kind of embody who you are. And I, I think back two years ago when I was kind of on the fence of where, mm -hmm. what I wanted to do with Domo, uh, I won't forget the night that I was actually out. I was recording a rugby match for the Utah Warriors and I got a phone call from Chad. Okay. And he says, Hey, Catherine wants to call you. Is that all right? And I was like, uh, sure. I mean, Catherine's never called me before. We weren't having one-on-ones at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, sure. And, and you called and you said, Hey, meet me for lunch tomorrow. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, like she's got things to do. Sure. In fact, it was a day you were actually going on, you were taking a, a girl's trip. So you were yeah. going on a vacation that <laughs> afternoon. Um, and I just kind of thought to myself, like, she didn't have to make that phone call. She mm -hmm. didn't have to reach out. She's got other managers between me and her that sure. could have handled this situation. But the fact that you're willing to get involved and have the conversation, I mean, that that lunch that we had uh, changed the next two years of my life, and it will probably continue to change uh, the, the future of my career. So again, I don't think that uh, advice that you're sharing is lip service. I think that, again, you've you've done that and you've demonstrated that. I remember that lunch. It was, it was profound for me too, right? In that I think it's such a beautiful thing when we can connect together, mm -hmm. right? And um, really share experiences, share concerns. Um, and yeah, so I think it's, it's one of those things where if we can make the time yeah. and remember to, in the busyness of life, quote yeah. unquote, right. Not lose sight of those moments, Yep. then it makes a huge difference. Well, and I mean, you've got a husband, you've got kids, mm -hmm. uh, you understand the balance that, uh, that takes on, you know, that life takes on. Uh, I, I remember having the conversation with someone else who was talking about, you know, the balance between work life balance. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always have been a proponent of saying like work is important, no doubt, but what is happening behind the scenes, I always have felt is more important. Mm -hmm. You know, what you won't be an effective, uh, asset to the company or the team if things aren't right behind the scenes. True. And so you've always got to be able to take care of yourself and Again, that's something else that uh, you've demonstrated to me. I mean, in our past conversations about, you know, what do you really want out of your career? Right. One of the things that I always shared is I want flexibility because I've got young kids and yeah. Domo's respected that. And I believe you said that that was one of your highest values at this point in time, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think um, that conversation is a really important one to have with your manager or your team, both mm -hmm. directions, right? Because I think what is important to you at 25 is not necessarily what's most right. important at 35 and 45. So acknowledge that, um, that it changes is key, but being really mindful about, but for me right now, for mm -hmm. the next three to five years, mm -hmm. let's say, what's number one and what's number two. Right. And, you know, I always say, you've got to focus on those two. Everything else takes like an eight way tie for third place, Absolutely. you know? Um, but if you're clear and honest with yourself about, is it flexibility? Is it growth? You know, sometimes I know early in my twenties for me growing and learning fast was like the most important thing, sure. right? I think that resonates um, with a lot of people. Yeah. Yep. So sometimes in your career, you're like, I just, I'll do anything because I just want to grow and learn. Mm -hmm. Other times flexibility with, you know, your personal life is important. But the net of it is we are each captains of our own destiny, mm -hmm. right? We choose for our careers. And I think the happiest um, designers, product managers, engineers are those that are self-aware enough yep. to know. For me right now, 
this is what's really important because then you can have the conversation with your manager. You can look at where you work and see, is this conducive? Is it, you know, can we figure out a way yep. um, to where it's a win-win for everyone yep. um, and making that choice. So, cause yep. I think it can all be done, just not all at once. Right. Yep. So you just have to have um, to decide for yourself with your family. What's most what's important? important. Yeah. Yep. And allow that to change. Yeah. Yep. But the market is great. The economy is great, right? There's so much opportunity. Um, you can absolutely achieve it. Sure. So one of the things that uh, I get asked quite a bit, and it's coming from the people who are in that early stage career, who are just wanting to learn a lot and get a lot of experience. Uh, I often get posed with the question, you know, I'm at a new company, I'm at a new startup, I'm at a new business. And I just don't feel like my executives care about UX. Mm. Uh, I don't feel like they value what it is UX can bring to the table. Uh, how do I help them understand the value? Because ultimately, they do want to be an asset. They do want to be effective. Uh, they just don't feel valued. Uh, and I wanted to have this conversation with you because, again, when I started at Domo three years ago, I felt that... Um, I felt that a lot of people were kind of in the business of just facilitating what was being asked of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe just kind of carrying something through that they just didn't necessarily, they weren't involved in the strategy. They weren't involved in the idea. They, you know, if I'm really going to belittle it, I'm going to say they felt like they're just pixel pushers. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you and I both yeah. know that we, yeah. there's been people that have left over it. And there's, sure. there's people in that same situation at other companies uh, you know, that are just feeling unhappy in that, in that situation. But what I've noticed over the last three years is that Domo's product has, like, not the product itself, but the product team has evolved tremendously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I feel like things used to be prescribed to me, I don't feel like they are anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there is a level of autonomy uh, that's been reached and it's taken time to evolve there. Have, did you notice that switch or transition yourself in the process over the years or? Yeah, hey, what I are think, your thoughts? I think it's an evolution, right? Hopefully in any organization that you work or even just in my personal life, I hope I'm not the same person I am today that I right. was three years ago. Yep. Um, and same thing with any team or company. Um, so I think that's really healthy and you want to see that um, evolution. You know, my thought is a couple of fold, you know, one, you have to kind of look at the product and where it is in its life cycle. Mm -hmm. There are stages, just like a child grows through different stages, a product actually takes kind of those stages. So in its infancy, you're really trying to figure out, um, you know, what's, what is this thing, yeah. you know? And so there's a lot of experimentation. You're trying to find market fit, right? Um, as the product grows older, there are more pillars and understanding of, okay, this is what really is resonating. Where do we want to go from here, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, you know, there's future phases of maintenance yeah. and um, incremental innovation and, and then spinning off new business units and, and so forth. So I think really when you're first and you're coming up in your career, I find not everyone realizes that cause we're all new to it, yep. you know? So that was really um, important for me to learn and recognize is, oh, the product itself, the company itself mm -hmm. is going to go through different phases. And what we do with a young product is not the same thing we do with a quote unquote teenage product. Right. right? Yep. Um, so that's the first thing I think the, the second piece of advice I would give having, cause we all go through this, right. When mm -hmm. we come out of school and we're like, Hey, I think that I can really add value, particularly when it comes to UX, every product in the world right now cares about the usability of Absolutely. it. You have to, that's a given. Right. Um, so there is care. I think what may sometimes happen is the communication and understanding of what is the yeah. evidence of that care. We might just be missing signals, you know? Yeah. So my first question would be, what are some of the activities or signals or feedback that you're looking for that you think would show you that the management team cares about the design? Yeah. And have you articulated that? Yeah. They may be thinking that they absolutely care and they're doing the right things, but they may not know, right? Yep. And then I think the question goes the other direction too. When we're first coming up, we may not always understand the business side of things. Yep. Hey, what is the go-to-market strategy? Which user are you targeting first, right? Yep. We all want to champion the user, but I often have to ask, which one? Yeah. 
right? Um, so being clear on that, I find sometimes is, you know, eye-opening yep. for um, the teams where understanding the business strategy, the go-to-market, the sequencing, right? Who are we targeting first? Then mm-hmm. where are we going? Um, can really help to align those things. I, my experience says, actually, everyone does care. Yes. I haven't found a situation where that's not true. Yep. What I do see sometimes, though, is just misaligned understanding yeah. on okay. how to go about it. I think that's such a fair point. I mean, yeah. m- this misaligned communication is, is, is a very fair point. You can complain all you want, uh, but what are you doing about it? Are you trying to have the tough conversations? Are right. you trying have to... Have you asked the question? Yeah. I mean, have, we, have we tried to bring synergy to the situation that uh, would allow us to align, evaluate, modify, and then improve? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's something that's that, again, I think you've helped champion at Domo. And I remember one specific a very specific meeting actually where we were sitting in and um, I was with a couple other team members who were starting to feel this way of like everything is just prescribed to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember in this very specific meeting, we got, we were looking at mocks and a couple co- questions came up about how we're actually tackling this problem. And uh, there was kind of pros and cons to each of these different ways sure. we were looking at it. And one of the things that you said, and you probably don't even remember this. I don't. (laughs) One of the things that you said is Dylan and team will figure it out. Mm. And that was, in fact, when it happened, I had a couple of the other team members kind of Uh look at me. I'll just kind of give me like the, really? (laughs) That just happened? And Mm. I I kind of go like, I was glad that they saw the evidence of things aren't prescribed and there is autonomy. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it came via communication of sure. what value looks like. Um, do you think there was a role of like trust that, that goes into that or? I think so. I mean, in terms of, um, just developing the relationships, right? So I think part of it is, um, the designer trusting mm-hmm. that, the management team wants great design. Mm-hmm. So, if, right, it kind of goes to your assumptions. Are you assuming that they want it or are you assuming they don't? Sure. Because that's going to kind of bias yeah. how you interpret well, everything, yeah. right? Yes, absolutely. So there's, I think that's evidence of trust that grows. So do you assume that they um, are interested in great design? And then the other direction is um, does the management team trust that if they provide the feedback that we're going to get to continue to iterate, yeah. right? Um, because sometimes I think managers might want to hold back because they don't want to upset, mm-hmm. right? And that, and the, and they want the right outcome, um, but they very much value, right, the employee. Yeah. And so I think sometimes there's some misguided holding back. Sure. Yeah. Um, when really the dialogue is what everyone is craving. Yeah. You know. So I think that that trust develops over time, and I would say. Um, it's getting to know um, each other's communication styles, patterns, right? And I, so I kind of trace it more to that. Yep. Um, and that can only be built through interaction. Yep. That's kind of my net is... I totally agree. The net takeaway is if you're not really interacting, if you're having the side conversations and saying, well, I just don't think they want to, mm-hmm. then it's never going to work. Like yep. you've got to interact because only through interaction can trust and relationships and understanding of styles and expectations come through. Yeah. So I think you're right. That is the ultimate outcome. Well, and you, you mentioned like this bias that creeps in. If you, if you decide that they want a good experience or if you decide that they don't want a good experience and that's actually interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, one of the things that I've been told, uh, by some of the people who I look at as mentors at Domo is they've shared that some of the reason that I've had early stage success at Domo was because of uh, my ability to listen, yeah, uh, and then and then also run with it. And absolutely, I didn't actually. I never saw it that way. Like that's not what I was anticipating trying to do. Um, but I, the advice that I've given that I found has been really helpful at Domo is that you know if if an executive wants to be involved in a project, they're a stakeholder who deserves a seat at the table. Um, and take their, their feedback as another input in the feedback that you're gathering. And don't just write it off as if it's like, you're not in the trenches, you don't know. Right. right? And that kind of comes from that bias that you were describing. It does. It's one of the things I love that you talk about, right? Which is um, 
the user is not just the person yeah. who is on the other side of the screen. Right. That user group actually does include the business. The business. Uh huh. And that's I think what ha- what I love about um, what you bring, in addition to a, mo- a ton of other things, but just that perspective. I think really opens people's minds to understand it's a multifaceted thing. Uh, Agreed. And one of the things that I've told designers to do is like, you know, if you've got an executive who's prescribing what to do, Mm -hmm. do it. Sure. You know, just, just try it and give it a, don't give it a half hearted effort because that's very transparent when you're like, yeah, I did it because he told me to do it, but it's a (laughs) terrible idea. So it's not very good. Uh, It's very transparent when people do that. And I've always found like, give it a full effort. Sure. Maybe you identify a couple potholes and then try and fix those potholes. Right. And try then and... ask the question. Yeah. Say, is this what you were thinking? Because I love this about it, but here's some things that we're finding challenging. And I've always found that to be a really good give and take at Doma is that yeah. when approached that way, I always feel like we've come to great solutions in the end. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that came with trust or that came with, you know, maybe uh, avoiding the bias of how you look at a project. I don't know, but could be. it definitely has contributed to better autonomy, better trust, and better facilitating and build, building great products. So I agree. The outcome is just um, kind of the measurement, right? Yeah. The experience is better for the consumer. Okay. So the last question I'm going to ask you yeah. is you've got UX designers who listen to this podcast. You've got product managers who listen to the podcast who are in very early stages of their career, You know, mm-hmm. whether they're in school or they're in the first five years of their career. What is a one-line piece of advice that you would give them at this stage? Mm. I think what I would say is uh, hustle, work hard. Yeah. Don't be afraid of hard work. I think that um, if you're willing to do that, you'd be amazed at the journey that life will take you on. And it probably won't be what you expect sure. in the best way, right? I, sure. That's one of the things I've learned in life is just you can't predict it. Um but what you can kind of control or, or really um, be thoughtful about is the level of hard work that you put into something, your attitude, right? And yeah. so I think that gives you a real sense of self mm-hmm. um, and it makes it so that the journey is fun because I promise you that. Like if you work hard and um, you approach it assuming that great things are going to happen, it's a fun time. It's a fun journey sure to is. go on. Sure is. I appreciate everything you've shared, the insights that you've you've uh, you know really put out here for everyone to benefit from. Thank you for your time. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Absolutely, that's another that's a wrap on another episode of Design Today. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs>